Hello and uh, welcome to Granada Reports, live with the latest across the northwest. Hello, thanks for joining us on the programme this evening. Arriving to see justice, Olivia Pratt Corbell's family see Thomas Cashman's getaway driver jailed and given a new identity for his protection. Paul Russell admitted he had helped Cashman escape the scene, but he also told police it was Cashman who'd killed Olivia. We'll have the latest on that case from Liverpool Crown Court. Also on the programme tonight. Seeing their name in light, the King and Queen Consort get a glimpse of the Eurovision stage and grab a quick chat with the UK's big hope, May Muller. It was a simple good watch you. It's really cool. Great interest. Thank you. Taking you on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. It doesn't really matter what you put me through. Sonia, our Eurovision entry 30 years ago, back on stage in Liverpool. An epic at the Etihad, we're live as Manchester City target the title against Premier League leaders Arsenal. And weather-wise, we replace slightly cooler than average temperatures with something a little bit warmer. But what does that mean weather-wise? I'll tell you later on in the programme. Well, first, he helped the man who killed nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell by giving him a lift in his car on the night of the murder and disposing of his clothes. Today, Olivia's family were in court in Liverpool to see the moment Paul Russell was jailed for 22 months. The judge said she understood the sentence might be seen as lenient. Olivia's father uttered the word joke from the public gallery. But Liverpool Crown Court was told Russell had given police a vital breakthrough by actually naming Thomas Cashman as the killer. Russell has now been given a new identity and he could be released from jail in six months. Our correspondent Anne O'Connor reports. Olivia's mother Cheryl was back in court today, supported by her family. She lowered her head and closed her eyes as they heard how 41-year-old Paul Russell had helped her daughter's murderer in the hours after the shooting last August, driving Thomas Cashman away and moving the clothes he'd worn. Cashman had run to Paul Russell's partner's house after his relentless pursuit to murder convicted criminal Joseph Nee ended with him shooting Olivia and her mother as Nee escaped into their house in Dovecot. Russell said he had no idea a child had been killed and did what he was told because he was terrified of the drug dealer he called Tommy. His heart sank, he said. His world fell apart. He just wanted Cashman away from the house. The day after Olivia's murder, the gunman Thomas Cashman saw Paul Russell and whispered to him, don't say nothing. But when Russell found out that the victim of the shooting had been a nine-year-old schoolgirl, he's said to have vomited, then contacted the police and met them two days later in Speak Retail Park, naming Thomas Cashman as the man they wanted. Tell me what I'm arrested for. Okay. You're under arrest for on suspicion of murder. Cashman was arrested in Runcorn days later. Paul Russell's partner was a key witness at his trial, and both will now have new identities and live away from Merseyside. Since going to the police and admitting at a hearing last October to assisting an offender, Russell has had death threats and appeared on a video link today because of safety concerns. His barrister said he was the epitome of remorse. What he did was a source of shame till the day he died, he said. The judge, Mrs Justice Yip, seen here sentencing Cashman earlier this month, said Russell's 22-month sentence might seem lenient, but it was reduced in part because Russell had broken the silence around who committed the murder. Olivia's father, John Pratt, was heard saying joke as she handed down the 22-month term. Cashman plans to appeal against his 42-year jail sentence. Anna O'Connor, ITV News, Liverpool Crown Court. 
Well, next fears about the amount of sewage being dumped in our rivers. The MP for Westmoreland and Lonsdale, Tim Farron, says we need to get a grip on it. The Environment Agency has revealed six of the top ten longest discharges in England last year were in Cumbria. In Cockmel in South Lakeland, sewage was discharged at the Cock pumping station into the River Ear for nearly four and a half thousand hours. We've seen sanitary towels come down this river, we've seen wet wipes come down this river. Today it's quite clear, uh, many times it's full of sludge, it's actually brown, you can't see the bottom of the river. United Utilities says it is investing millions of pounds to improve the nearby pumping station at Cork in Cartmel. A man from Lancashire has been jailed for a three-year campaign of stalking against a woman from Kent. 44-year-old Daniel Newby from uh, Nittingham, uh, Whittingham near Preston targeted a former business associate, sending her death threats using photographs of her to make sexually explicit images and bombarding her with 1,200 messages online. He was jailed for 25 months. Lancashire Police and the Fire Service have started a joint investigation into what started a fire at a derelict hotel in Blackpool. Twelve fire engines were called to the new Hackett's Hotel on the prom on Monday. The building was so badly damaged it's now having to be demolished. Police say they're keeping an open mind about what caused it. Well, next, and the King and Queen Consort lit up the ACC Arena in Liverpool today to unveil the stage for the Eurovision Song Contest. They were given a tour of the venue and introduced to the team involved as the city prepares for the first semi-final in less than two weeks' time. The UK is hosting the annual competition on behalf of last year's winners, Ukraine. Victoria Grimes reports. It's a show which promises to be fit for a king. So who better to reveal the set to the world than Charles III himself. As Liverpool prepares to take centre stage once again, the King and Queen consort met some of those making the magic happen. He obviously wanted to come and see the biggest party on the planet. So, um, yeah, he's, he's popped in. Maybe we'll give him some inspiration for the coronation. It was a simple good watch you. It's really cool. Great interest. Thank you. Taking you on. Thank you. No pressure. No pressure. I'm feeling really excited. I think being here and like being able to like soak up the atmosphere, you know, a few weeks before the big big day, it really really helps. Yeah. It makes me feel even more like ready. I'm ready yeah. to go. I'm like, get me on that stage now. It may be being held in Liverpool, but Eurovision will have a distinct Ukrainian flavour. Yulia Sanina will be presenting the contest. She says UK support has been immense. I told uh, His Majesty that we are grateful for everything that the UK do and will do for Ukraine because we feel that support and we need it so badly. Well, it's a great opportunity today to finally reveal the stage to the world. Everything's switched on. We have two and a half thousand lights up there, a number of moving parts, and I hope it just builds the excitement towards Eurovision in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> There was a warm welcome at the next engagement central library where crowds lined the streets and the royal couple were keen to meet those who turned out. He said, I see your umbrella's gone inside out. <laughs> it was lovely. It was lovely. <laughs> and I just said, thank you for coming to Liverpool. We're very honoured. Well, you were struggling with that umbrella, weren't you? Well, I was, but I couldn't find my flag at home this morning, so I had to <laughs> improvise. And it wasn't an umbrella. It was a parasol. <laughs> and it's now a broken parasol. <laughs> it was lovely. Both of them were lovely, and I'm delighted that they came. Well, he came over here, and which we were gobsmacked about, and then I shook his hand and said, God bless King Charles. He said, that's very kind of you. Inside, a ceremony to strengthen the ties between Liverpool and its twin city, Odessa, linking the libraries in both cities via e-link with Ukrainian First Lady, Elena Zelensky. One year ago, I was here uh, for the drop-in session for displaced Ukrainians, but it was the time when that idea to make sort of partnership between libraries started to come up in me. So today is kind of the logical point, a new beginning for the both sides, for Liverpool and for Odessa as well. I've been a fan of, a fan of him since, like, for, for a very long time. It's been a pleasure to me, like, yeah. as he come to Liverpool to London. It's a dream come true. It was a whirlwind trip, but one very much with Ukraine and its people at its heart. Victoria Grimes, ITV News, Liverpool. 
Yeah, a dream come mm. true. What a wonderful way to put that. Uh, well, next up, the condition that's affected almost 2 million people across the UK after the pandemic. Long COVID can cause major fatigue and has completely changed the way some people are living their lives. In the Isle of Man, they have a special service dedicated to helping those with debilitating illnesses such as long COVID and the chronic fatigues condition, ME. Our Isle of Man reporter Joshua Stokes reports. I worked full time, um, probably more than full time, seven days a week. I had a normal life, but that's changed. Pauline tested positive for COVID in March 2020. And after experiencing mild symptoms, her energy levels started to deteriorate. I lost my voice and I was very breathless. We keep waiting for it to get better, only it never did. It just kept getting worse and worse and worse. After many cardiac tests, Pauline was told she had developed a condition causing major fatigue, brought on by COVID. It's limited everything. At its worst, I couldn't get to the bathroom by myself. I had to be carried to the bathroom. And I was always such an independent person before all this. And having to have somebody bathe me, shower me, you know, whatever, wash my hair, dry me afterwards, help me get dressed, it's been soul destroying. If I'm totally honest, I didn't want to be alive anymore. That's being blunt about it. And after three years, it's, it's literally only in the last six weeks, I've managed to wash my own hair. And that's such an achievement. Pauline is one of a number of people living in the Isle of Man with a condition causing chronic fatigue. According to Manx Care, more than a thousand adults are living with long COVID and 350 are living with ME. As a result, the team has launched a new service dedicated to treatment and early detection, but it's taken time. Craig has been campaigning for the change for over a decade. He was diagnosed with ME in 2010. It was a bit of a battle to, to try and get help. Um, I really liked my GP, he just didn't know what to do. And I've just been absolutely determined that other people won't suffer as much as I did, that they'll get that early advice and intervention so that they won't get as severe as, as, as I am. Before the change, Craig had to travel to Liverpool for treatment all during a time where he was largely housebound and eventually advised to rest. Most of the time I'm, I'm quite bedbound. I have to be satisfied with enjoying the sounds that you can hear behind you of the, of the beach and, and reading a page or two of a book and, and a five minute conversation with my son. But I think the good thing is, is knowing that it will help people really from, you know, who find out they're ill now. And, and get that advice to, to make sure they bounce back. And that's the hope for those still suffering, now with a dedicated team in place to help. COVID happened and the lockdown happened, and then everything started opening up and people's lives went back to normal. And mine never has, you know, so it would be, uh, it'd be nice if it did. Joshua Stokes, ITV News in the Isle of Man. On to football now, and uh, we often talk about title deciders and six-point games, but tonight's game at the Etihad could well be both. The Premier League champions Manchester City in second place are taking on the league leaders, Arsenal. Our man David Chisnell joins us now. Are there any other clichés to describe this that we've missed, David? I think you've got most of them, Lucy, but I will throw in one phrase that often gets mentioned this time of year. The former Manchester United manager always used to call the end of the football season squeaky bum time. It's when the nerves really start to kick in. Who will hold their nerve tonight as Manchester City take on Arsenal? What many people are calling a title decider. You only have to look at the top of the Premier League table to see why people are calling it that. I mean, Manchester City, well, they're right up there with Arsenal, aren't they? And if they win tonight, well, then they will move to within two points of Arsenal. They will have two games in hand on them as well. City really are the form team right now with 11 wins in the last 12 games. Of course, City have already beaten Arsenal at the Etihad this season. That came back in January when they met in the FA Cup. It was 1-0 that night. In fact, City haven't lost at home to Arsenal since 2015. And if that run continues this evening, well, it's going to have a huge say on who wins the Premier League. But neither manager is getting too carried away. It's really important, not decisive, because still many 
tough game for both sides. We have more games to play, but uh, we cannot deny how important it is. If you win, definitely the destiny will be in our hands, and and we win this opportunity for the for tomorrow for the seven games left that still we have. If you want to be champion, you have to win those matches. It's as simple as that. We knew from the beginning and uh, the City was the team to beat. We are toe to toe with them. We knew that we had to go to the Etihad. That game is going to be really important. Is it going to define the season? Uh, the answer is no. So those are the thoughts of the managers. But what about the fans? Well, I've been speaking to some City supporters arriving here before kickoff. I think we will do, yeah. You know, we've got to win every game to uh, become champions, but I think we'll do it. Yeah, quite, quite confident. Why? Just the form that we're in at the moment. Just think we're playing quite good. We think it's going to be a difficult game. It's not going to be an easy one by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, we think we can do it. And if we do, then we move forward. But we've been coming for a very long time and anything can happen at all and frequently does. Well, the treble is still on for City, as well as the Premier League. They're also through to the Champions League semi-final and the final of the FA Cup. And today, the FA confirmed that for the first time in 12 years, that final between City and United at Wembley on June the 3rd will revert back to its traditional three o'clock kickoff. Well, while City focus on three trophies, for Liverpool, who are in action tonight, it's all about getting back into the Premier League's top four. Jurgen Klopp side, well, they are nine points adrift of those all-important Champions League qualification places and they're away at West Ham. We have to, to make the next step. That's it. We have to, to keep going. I think a lot, a lot of things to like in the last two games, two and a half games, and that's what we have to continue. We need to make sure that it's not that difficult for people to watch us, that they like it again and that they think, OK, that's it. That's a, a good way to, to start a football game. It's a good way to, to play a football game and to finish a football game, and that's exactly what we want to do. David, thank you. Now, earlier we saw the King and Queen Consort getting their first glimpse of the stage for this year's Eurovision Song Contest in Liverpool. Meanwhile, across town, Sonia, who came second at Eurovision 30 years ago with Better the Devil You Know, was back on stage. Yes, yeah, Sonia, sometimes labelled the Scouse songstress by the tabloids, was in Liverpool for a special one-off performance, as Caroline Whitmore explains. Yes, yeah, Sonia, here we go! As Liverpool gears up to host the Eurovision Song Contest next month, Liverpool's very own Sonia Evans, who you may remember was a runner-up at the Song Contest 30 years ago. Well, she's now joined forces with the European Youth Music Refugee Choir here at the Everyman Theatre in the heart of the city. The choir is made up of refugees and asylum seekers from around the world, including more recently Ukraine. Oh, the refugee choir are just brilliant. Music unites people. And when you think, you know, of the atrocities and the conflicts that have been going on in these countries, it's amazing that the National Lottery reaches out and helps and brings them in with, with open arms. Could you never stop me from words you'll never stop me from loving you no matter what yeah it's my big number one song and all the refugees loved it and um, we've got a lovely woman called Tatiana and she's going to be singing the second verse in Ukraine <laughs> My name is Tatiana, this is my son Daniel and this is my daughter Zlata. And almost a year ago we came from Ukraine when the war started. I decided to run away because I wasn't sure about the future of my children. My partner is still there. We could hear rockets, people with uh, guns. We decided just to hide. I'm a singer and this choir heals me just to understand that I'm singing with a big star that is part of history of your vision of music. Before she came, I was more like, not confident. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Are you OK? Yeah. But when she came and she is so warm and she was so sweet, so yeah, I relax and oh, I'm like at home. When I sing, I actually try to abstract myself from the world. like. I am singing, I know I'm here, I'm trying to do my best and I don't think about anything else. Being part of this choir is really nice because it's uh, differ different cultures, music 
is something that can unite every country. Music is the word of love, the word of heart. Do you feel that Liverpool are going to do a, a good job on behalf of Ukraine? I think so. I hope so, at least. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> you came second. Do you think you were robbed and you should have won it 30 years ago? Absolutely. <laughs> People say, are you over it? I'm like, no. <laughs> If I wouldn't have come so close, I don't think I would have been as het up about it. It's just that it was one vote, you know what I mean? And I was convinced I'd won. If I would have won, I would have pestered him to bring it back to Liverpool. So this is a dream come true for me, isn't it? Yeah, she was robbed. Nice to see Sonia. Uh, here's James with the weather. Why do I need a shower? I've been out in the rain. The faster you go, the sooner you'll be out. You'll save water too. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Hello there, good evening. Not too bad a day today. Fair amount of cloud, but some bright spells uh, mixed in. At the moment, we've got to sort of at or below average temperatures, but down to the southwest of us, it's a lot warmer and some of that air is heading in our direction. Problem is, it's also picking up a lot of moisture and it's turning this little system into a bit of a troublemaker. Uh, it's just one of several little features wrapped around a very large low out towards the west of us. It's making it a little bit unpredictable in terms of exactly when that rain is set to hit and just how wet it's going to get. Now as far as this evening goes, well a lot of the cloud from today actually breaking up to give us some pretty long uh, spells of clear skies and that's going to allow temperatures to drift down to around 3 Celsius, enough to see a little bit of ground or grass frost but towns and cities are looking more at 6 and 7, so cool rather than cold. Tomorrow then breeze is going to start picking up, it's going to be a nice bright start, even a sunny start to the day. Then the clouds start to build from the south and the west and eventually Eventually, uh, this rain band starting to show its hand. As we get towards the rush hour through the evening, that's set to get a little bit wetter. And like I say, it could be heavy at times. And as far as temperatures go, even with that cloud into the afternoon, looking at a degree or two up on today, so looking at highs of around 13 Celsius, uh, might be tempered by that increasing breeze. Once that rain clears Thursday evening and overnight, we're on to uh, some slightly more settled weather, looking at highs of around 13 on Friday, hopefully a brighter day. Again, not much of a breeze and then we're looking at 15 or 16 celsius on saturday and then expect lots of showers on sunday united utility sponsors itv granada weather tomorrow as summer approaches we unite our two winter sports heroes slalom skier dave riding and snowboarding world champion mia brooks for a cozy chat yeah it's all going downhill <laughs> fast uh join us tomorrow bye bye, bye.